Hi guys, welcome to House Hobby Farm. I just, this is Donna. I just wanted to do a video quickly about turkeys, how to take care of turkeys and chickens. I've heard from some of the vendors when I was searching for turkeys after mine didn't make it in the mail, um, which have never happened before. I've always had them all alive. Maybe one doesn't make it or something. So it's kind of really weird and disappointing and very sad that that happened. But honestly, almost all those kind of turkeys and chickens, a lot of them end up um, being shipped out here from a hatchery for people. And um, there are a couple local hatcheries that I did find, but they weren't really local for me. They were pretty far away. They were like an hour and a half away and i really just didn't have time to go way down there and back because that's like three hours and so and then also um they were all they were selling only heritage turkeys so it wasn't exactly what i was looking for but that's okay like i was willing to try heritage turkeys and i was actually going to go down there and get them but <clears throat> i didn't because I was able to find something much, much closer. It was about 40 minutes away. But anytime you live out, far out in the suburbs, you just accept the fact that if you want to go get something or go to the movies or whatever, you're going to have to drive a little bit. It's just a fact. That's the price you pay for moving out here. So anyway, um, this video should go be the next video up against the video we just finished about picking up the turkeys at the post office and how all that works um, this is like a follow-up these are the babies here let me you can see these it's kind of hard to see through the wire let me so this is the nursery I have 10, two, eight broad breasted and two Kentucky bourbons. And they are with this mama hen, which is a cotton silky cross. And these two little white hens, which I've noticed one of them is not being very nice to these babies. They're very uh, bonded to this mama hen. So I'm pretty sure tonight I'm gonna take those little hens, those two white little hens out. Those are hens that I had um, hatched myself and this mother adopted those hens plus many more. So anyway, as you can see, I have water here. It's a big water jug and it automatically like drops water in as the water needs to. And there's um, a high protein feed here for the turkeys. And then this blue tub has a heat lamp there and it has an entrance two exits and entrance so those turkeys if they feel that they need to get out and they need to um, get warm they can do that but i will turn the light off today once it reaches probably 80 89 90 degrees i'll turn it off because first of all it's much cooler than that right now and last night and they're not using it it was in the high 60s last night it looks like they all made it there was an escape there was an escape area where they kind of were escaping out of a hole we found we fixed that. We put a piece of wood in the way right there, as you can see. And so they're just kind of getting used to their area, their environment, jumping up and down on the boards, running around. We have a little perch ladder. There's another wooden perch. Those big ones like to use that. And then over here in the corner, there's a perch really close to the ground. So if they want to perch on that, they can. So what this is, I call it the nursery. What it is, is a chain link, square chain link fence with a gate. And there's no lid. So the lid here, as you can see, 
This is the box we carried the turkeys out in, right here. Let's see if I can get it in the view. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I'll be uh, tossing that in the in the um, the wood wood garden that we're doing because we're going to use that to backfill it. And there's old. This is here an old door. This is an old sliding door when we did our remodel. Um, I kept all the windows and doors. So I could use them to maybe make small greenhouses for seedlings and stuff in the winter. And um, currently right now we're using it as a rooftop for this uh, garden bay. Because it's nice and heavy. A dust storm's not going to blow it away. And up here are some big heavy pillars that we have on this piece of wood to make sure the wind doesn't blow it away. Okay, so let's get to it. Um, let's talk about what you need. What do you need? What do you need to raise turkeys and chickens? Well, one, you need a brooder. I'll show you in a little bit what my brooder looks like. Look, it's nothing fancy. I don't spend a lot of money on stuff like that. The brooder is basically a water tank. Now, you probably don't want to go out and just buy a water tank because they're expensive. They start out a hundred dollars a hundred and fifty dollars and they go up depending on how big you get them I have a smaller type of water tank that we used for the sheep and this water tank had a hole in it so we usually repurpose those type of things for a container garden to grow more food or for a chick brooder well this one was a perfect size for a chick brooder and that's what I used and I put um, I put wood shavings in the bottom. You can buy a tractor supply or any local feed store. And they're like uh, wood shavings, pine wood shavings. So I put those in the bottom. And then I have like a small feeder like this. Depending on how many you buy. Let's see. This is the... Uh, let me see. I'm trying to figure out the camera here. So this is a small feeder. It's basically a, uh, just a mason jar or a mayonnaise jar that screws into the bottom. Um, there's other kinds like this one here on the ground. You fill it from the top and all the food drops in. There are some wood chips that they kicked in it. And then you need an automatic waterer, which really is just a, a tank with water that releases over the time that they drink and you also need a red heat lamp red do not please please do not put a white light bulb in there for those chicks yes it does keep them warm but it will also keep them very um, agitated and very upset all the time they will never quiet down and have peace um, they'll always be um, agitated and they won't really be happy because if you can imagine living with a white bright white light in your eyes all the time what that does is it, it blinds them it causes them sight problems so if you get um, I I actually had a ceramic heater that you screw into those um, brooder lamps and it's basically um, I'll show you one I have one set up right now they come in different sizes and I had a ceramic piece that went in there that was really for reptiles it didn't put off any light but it did put off a heat source well my turkeys weren't very happy it didn't take me long maybe an hour to see that they weren't settling in and they weren't very happy so what I did was I took a red heat lamp and I put it in a, a light fixture that is for brooders. But this one was actually for reptiles, which they're very similar. The only difference with this one is it has a dial on it. So I can dial up the heat or dial down the heat because we are in a house it's not going to be outside in the cold, cold, cold weather. So then I would just have, it would be fine. Just use a regular one. 
but I need to dial down the heat because my home was um, obviously controlled temperatures. And if it was full blast with this big red bulb, it would definitely um, overheat them. So turkeys are very sensitive. They don't like to be overheated. They don't like to be too cold. And they also operate mostly on instincts. So sometimes they're not too smart. Sometimes they will not um, move out of the heat, out from under the lamp if they get too hot and they'll get too cold. Or sometimes um, they won't, when they get too cold, they will not move towards the heat. Um, I've had that happen a few times. I've also had turkeys that will drown themselves. So the best thing to do if they're going do what I always do when I first get them is I get a small a waterer and it's a little has a little tiny trough or a smaller trough and then I put like pebbles like rocks in there and the rocks fill up the space so they can't possibly drown themselves but they can still get their beaks between the rocks and the pebbles and get the water so that's the safest way to keep your turkeys from drowning themselves um, it happens I know it sounds crazy but silkies do it too and oftentimes chicks and turkeys they instinctively know this um, even though it still happens and they will kick the wood chips and stuff into the water so it protects everybody from drowning it's just strange and that's what they do so you do have to put your finger in there and pull out all of that but if you use the um, if you use the rocks and the pebbles, they're less likely to be kicking up all that stuff. And what they're doing is trying to fill the water up in a, in a way that they can still get to it, but not drown. Because they instinctively are a little leery of water. But some of them aren't. Some of them, they get in there and they get wet and then they can't get out. And I don't know how they do it. They Their he little heads end up in the water and they drown. I've found them like that. So, it's really kind of a strange thing. So anyway, if you have baby chicks, they will do it too, and they will also bury the water. So don't be alarmed if they do that. What you need to do is just clean it out, put some pebbles in there, and they will, they'll be fine. Um, so the main thing is controlling their temperature, controlling their water. I also put electrolytes in their water because usually those little guys are stressed. They hatch out from a day old. And they don't need food or water for three days. And that that's how the post office is able to ship them. Because normally um, they stay under their mother. And their mother waits for three days for all the eggs to hatch. And once all the eggs hatch, she leaves the nest. Any eggs that don't hatch, she abandons. Whether they're hatching or not, she abandons them. Because she knows her babies need food and water. So she takes them out and gets them foraging for food and water. Shows them where the food and water is. So that by nature is how they're able to ship them. And I know people say there's going to be people that disagree with that. They don't think it's right to ship the chicks and stuff like that. But, um, you know, turkeys are kind of hard to get. Everyone that gets turkey starts out that way. They start out by getting a chick at some point that was shipped. And then they breed them. And some of them start their own farms by doing that. So anyway, either way, they got to come from somewhere. Um, turkeys do, once they get older, handle the heat better than chickens do. Um, so they're a little easier to take care of in, in the summer heat. It's not my favorite time of year to do it, but because of the pandemic and everything going on, I've been looking for chicks since April, and I just couldn't find any, and I had to order them, and then I ordered them, and they showed up, and they were all dead. But the hatchery has agreed to um, give me my money back. They just wanted me to answer a few questions on what happened, so they can do a better job next time. So they'll probably credit me that money for a later day. And who knows, maybe in the winter I'll have something 
I'll get more hens or chicks or something. I don't know. I don't know what I'll do with the money. Or maybe they'll just credit it to my credit card. I might have them do that since I really don't need any poultry right now. And I have an incubator and I generally can hatch my own chicks, which is what I prefer to do. Although, as you can hear, when you do that, you get a lot of, you get, you get, you get roosters. So the roosters, I either process along with the turkeys because I um, you always end up with too many or the roosters, I just keep them and they, they learn to get along. And if they don't learn to get along, then they get thrown in the processing um, with the chicks. So anyway, these chicks will be ready to process in about 16 weeks. So late September will be their, their date for processing. Um, I do have a fan here, as you can see, that big square thing, that big black square thing right there. Can you see it? It's right there. Anyway, that is a just a box fan we buy it low so, or wherever I can get it cheapest and um, I keep that going because it's hot it gets hot out here and they've got shade and I'll put up these little um, things here and that'll protect them and give them a little bit more shade I just see this one again pecking at the turkeys if I keep seeing that I will separate them because I don't like that Oh, oh, they're both doing it too. Watch this hen. She's going after the turkeys big time. Um, that's to be expected. Um, chickens, like any other animal, are territorial. And this is their little mama hen over here. And they're territorial. And they don't really like the turkeys in their territory. So... They will be moving. I will be moving them. I will probably separate them even now because they're being really kind of aggr really aggressive. I usually don't like to move hens, new hens, into the flock during the day because it seems to me they tend to do better and acclimate better, and the other hens some tend to accept them better when you do it at night. I might not have a choice at this point. Because I don't have any place to put these little two hens. But their old, their flock that they grew up with a few weeks ago that were placed in there um, together. So maybe they will protect them and they will still be bonded to them. I don't know. We'll see. I'm definitely moving them though because I could see that they could really harm one of these chicks. And these chicks are really important to us. It's our white meat for the next year or longer. I mean, I really wasn't expecting the 10 of them would continue to survive. Of course, this we're not over, we're not through the summer yet. I could still lose a couple. We'll see what happens. Um, I've also heard from a producer that he says that the bourbon turkeys also do very well in the heat out here. So um, he sold, he had a lot of bourbons that he sold and he also sold some other heritage breeds. But they, like I said, they just don't get that big. The bourbons are the biggest, they'll get the largest, and that's 30 to 35 pounds. And that's if you feed them right. So how do you feed them right? You give them um, high meat bird protein, because these are meat birds. We do uh, produce our own food here. We still do go to the grocery store, because we can't possibly produce everything. But we do produce a lot of our own food, mainly most of our own meat. Um, I rarely buy meat at the store, and I don't like buying meat at the store. I don't really like how it tastes after raising my own. So, um, high-protein meat bird food is what you give turkeys if you're going to keep them raised. They need shade. They need shelter. Um, they may need a fan. They get very big, very quick. You have to check their food and water every single day because they eat and drink a lot because they're growing very fast. And they can get aggressive, especially if it's a tom. And if you have small children or kids, they can chase your kids. Or your kids will run and they will ensue the chase because they're running. So there are turkeys that do get aggressive. Um, 
I really haven't had that problem, but I had that problem when I was a kid. We had a couple turkeys that were aggressive, and they, every time we went into the chicken coop, they would fly up with their wings and talons, um, try to get you. They were very, very protective of their environment, and I believe they were white broad-breasted. So, I think there's some ants out here. Jack, are these ants biting you? Let me show you, Jack. Hi, Jack. I think, I think there's ants out here biting you. I see you kind of jumping around. So this is uh, Jack, one-eyed Jack Spratt. Um, Jack was given to me to train. He's a Jack Rock. Okay, we're going to move out of this area because there's ants right here, which I need to probably treat with tenacious earth because ants will disrupt and disturb the chicks. Um, they can... I've had uh, baby chicks, they were very young, they weren't this big, eat baby chicks. So if it's an aggressive ant, um, it could be a problem. I just don't like chicks or, or gophers or groundhogs near my baby chicks. Gophers will also kill baby chicks. So I'm definitely going to get some dinotenaceous earth or some borax and organically get rid of these and then I'll probably put a border of borax all around this hen house or this nursery so these chicks don't get um so we don't have an infestation basically so anyway <clears throat> if you have any questions about the turkeys and stuff um just uh, make your comments below and uh, keep in mind if you're not set up for poultry and turkeys then probably really shouldn't be raising them but that's okay people do it people are gonna do what they need to do during this pandemic to survive and they're gonna be wanting to secure meat for their family and I completely understand that that's why we do what we do because because you just never know you never know what's going to happen nobody saw this coming um, I try to prepare for all kinds of events that could happen anything that could happen and that I could prepare for the family and make sure that we have enough meat and food and whatever um, the beef prices right now we're like crazy right now because of everything that's going on in the world right now so luckily I have plenty of beef I really don't even need a calf right now but down the road I'll be buying a calf down the road to replenish my meat supply and every year we buy turkeys and replenish our turkey supply so and even when you get these turkeys at the feed stores and tractor supply and stuff they're shipped they're shipped to there so the only way you can really um, source them is if you source them from a local turkey farmer. And I know there are some out here, but they're pretty far out from where I'm at. So I guess now I guess we can go look at the garden. I was um, out here watering, but I was pretty tired. I work at night, so sometimes if I look like if I look like I need some sleep, I probably do. Um, I watered last night. I'm probably not going to water anything um, today. And let's go take a look. A lot has been happening out here. I even missed a bit because I was working a lot. My husband was taking care of some things. Here we go. Flip. So this is the Hubbard squash. As you can see, this one here is really getting big. Look how big it is. This thing is bigger than my hand. See how it's just huge. It'll get much bigger than that. It's going to get three, four times bigger than that before it's even ready to harvest. Um, this plant was pretty wilted yesterday because it was hot. Um, I water the garden at night. And look, it's perked back up. It's doing well. It seems happy and later today it might get wilted again. When it is truly just wilted from heat stress the plant will recover 
if it has wilt disease, it will not recover. You come out in the morning and it will still be looking wilty. So, um, here's another squash. You see it? Yeah, like that. Um, and there's several uh, small little bitty ones too. And there's a couple that didn't survive. The tomato, I'll show you the one that didn't survive, but we'll talk about that. So, this one right here. All right, that's a Hubbard squash too. And it just died, it's, it's brown, it's dark brown. So what does that mean? Well, that could mean it didn't get pollinated. It could mean that it's just not a strong, healthy squash and it just wasn't worthy of continuing growing. And that happens. Um, it could be that it was a, a male flower that didn't get pollinated by the female. So um, it's just not going to survive. And there's another one up there too. It's smaller. Can you see it right there? See that? Yeah, that's what that happens. And really, there's nothing you can do to fix that, to change that, to stop that. So, it's kind of like you win some, you lose some. And I've got some squash flowers going on here. These are straight neck yellow squash. Look, the flowers on there and the fruits on there too. The fruits, I think that's kind of cool when the flowers still blooming, yet the fruit is still attached. And then you got this one here, same thing. Um, some people say, well, it looks like something was eating at it, but some people say it could be blossom rot. Um, usually not the case with squash. Usually it just has something to do with the pollination. <clears throat> My plants have been getting plenty of water, so I'm pretty happy with them. These are the midnight snacks. I'm gonna pick a couple. Looks like a bird got to this one. Mm -mm -mm. I usually those don't make it in the house unless I have a whole whole bunch of them. So now. These are the water troughs I was talking about that we use, can you also use for chicks. I also use them. Now this one here, let me get a better perspective here. Let's walk around. So <clears throat> this squash is doing pretty good. I do have some shade on it and stuff because these water troughs get hot in Arizona. And anywhere in the summer, they're going to heat up and get hot. You've got to shade them and cover them. I try to shade a lot of it. The plant shades some of it. As you can see here. So I'm going to walk over here and get in here. These are kind of loose, so they blow around a little bit, but they are anchored, and I kind of like them to be loose. So now we're inside here. This is an older water trough. It is rusted. It is barely holding that dirt in. And we have another big one out there like this one. It's really big. I think that one's like 150, maybe 200 gallons of water it holds. We're going to use that one to... Uh, put in place of this one that's rotting and rusting. This one is a smaller one. This is the perfect size for brooding. I don't know if you can see there, but I did drill some holes up and down in the sides because if you don't have a way to drain it, they will definitely get waterlogged and your plants will drown, basically. <laughs> So, this is the arbor. This is growing up. This is some shade. It's really kind of cozy in here during the day when it's hot. And this I pulled back a little bit because I wanted these beans right here. See the beans? I wanted them to get some uh, sun. And I kind of left this down because um, 
I wanted these plants to get morning sun and I also want the pollinators to be able to get in here and easily find their way in here to pollinate. Because I do have squash in here. I did pick a big one off of here. And here's a couple. It's still, they just keep producing all summer if you have them in the right environment. And this is another blue Hubbard. Look how big it is compared to my hand. And it, these stems are, that, that stem is really tough. It's very strong. I'm waiting to see how it's going to do. Now this one is another squash right here. It doesn't look that good. I don't think this one's going to make it. And here's another one, which it's soft inside. So these aren't any good. But there are other blooms. There's other little squashes on here. Throw those in the compost. And um, this is purslane right here. See how it's, I let it kind of pulled it over to the side and let it keep draping. When it was growing, growing too far close to the beans and stuff, I would just pull them out. Purslane is edible. It's high in vitamin C and uh, a lot of wonderful micronutrients. Um, you can eat them. They are weed, but I let it grow here just so it can shade these tanks and um, keep them from getting too hot. Plus, I can eat them. They do come up in different places, but I allowed it to stay there. So here's some uh, cucumbers. These cucumbers were a little itty bitty. The last time I did a video, they were like this big. And now look, they're blooming, trying to set on fruit. They're going up this trellis. And there's that one dead fruit right there. It's just rotted. Ah. See? But that's okay, that happens. Don't get too upset if that happens. It's not the end of the world. Believe me, I'm gonna get enough fruit off here that um, Everybody that's getting a Christmas gift is probably going to get a Hubbard squash if my squash survives. <laughs> so I do know there was a gopher in here, which really concerned me. I was worried he was going to eat my beautiful squash roots, and it just dies the same day. And there's nothing you can do to save it when that happens. So here's some squash here. That's doing good. Once it gets this size... You're not going to see that weird rotting stuff going on where it just didn't pollinate. You're not going to see that. They're, they're good to go. You don't have to worry about them once they get this size, which is, let me, sorry. It's like the size of my, it's bigger than my thumb. It's like two fingers. You can see. Big. Once they get that big, you're safe. So don't fret once they get that big. <laughs> 